In the 8th or 9th century BC, the Upanishads were composed in India. These were philosophic texts which contained earlier traditions of the land and were based upon centuries of speculative thought. All of existence was seen as one and a part of the same greater reality. The world of illusion, which we see around us through our veils of ignorance, was termed samsara. The purpose of philosophic thought was to break free from the spell of this unreality, the maya of the material world. The two best-known teachers of this time were Mahavira and Gautama Buddha, who were born in the middle of the 6th century BC. The Buddha gave a rational, philosophic message to his followers. He spoke of three noble truths, that there was pain in the world, that there was a reason for the pain, and that it could be removed by following the right path. Nirvana was the extinguishing of one's ego and self in the realization of one's true nature, which was of oneness with the universal spirit. The responsibility of salvation lay entirely upon the individual and his own efforts to discipline himself. Many found the path easier when they could pray to the Buddha and seek his benign help. In time, compassionate beings on their way to enlightenment or bodhisattvas were also conceived. They delayed their own salvation to help all sentient beings on the path. This new branch of Buddhism soon had many followers and began to call itself the Mahayana Order or the Great Vehicle. Meanwhile, in the land of Magadha, in the eastern plains of India, where the Buddha had preached, great centers of Buddhist study came up. These had the bountiful support of Buddhist and Hindu kings of the region, and they developed into vast monastic universities. At these centers of learning, the message of the Buddha and his many qualities of wisdom and compassion were studied in great detail. These qualities of Buddhahood were personified in a pantheon of deities which was created. By meditating upon the personified qualities, a worshipper was to imbibe the virtues presented. Having attained those qualities, one became that deity. The best known Buddhist universities, Nalanda, Vikramshila, and Udantapuri, were in eastern India, in the region of present-day Bihar. In fact, Bihar derives its name from the many viharas which flourished here. The greatest of these monastic centers was at Nalanda. It was a hub of learning where pilgrims and scholars came from all corners of Asia. Excavations at the Nalanda site have revealed numerous stupas, monasteries, hostels, staircases, meditation halls, and other structures. These speak of the splendor of the university, which was also famed for its three magnificent libraries. This was the thriving intellectual environment at Nalanda, 
which produced the most notable Buddhist thinkers. The 8th century saw the founding of the Pala Empire, which ruled over most of Bengal and Bihar till the 12th century. It was a period of flourishing trade and prosperity. The Palas were generous patrons of monasteries and art. Towards the end of the 8th century, Dharmapala founded a great university in present-day Bihar. The Vikram Shila University, which was to rival the importance of Nalanda itself. By this time, Buddhism had entered its third major phase, the Vajrayana school. It was this sophisticated philosophy which blossomed in the vibrant intellectual atmosphere of Vikramshila. In earlier Buddhist thought, liberation was possible only through many lifetimes of effort. The Vajrayana offered the possibility of Nirvana within a single lifetime. At the heart of this system was the teacher-initiate relationship, where the seeker was guided by his teacher. Complex rituals, mantras or chants, and mudras or hand movements of Vajrayana Buddhism were codified in the form of tantras. Tantra literally means to carry on knowledge. The emphasis in this period was on the intellectual quest. This is constantly reflected in the art. Previous art had been more naturalistic. Its focus had been on a gentleness, which moved us and dissolved our sense of the ego, which transported us through grace and ecstasy. The purpose of the art remained the same in this period. However, the dynamism of the intellect, which analyzes the mental processes of the realization of the truth, came to the fore. The many qualities of the Buddhahood within each of us and the steps on the path of enlightenment came to be studied and presented in detail. The qualities which move us towards the realization of the truth were presented in a manner which left no room for ambiguity or doubt. This was Vajrayana Buddhism, the vehicle of the thunderbolt, whose logic was as clear and as striking as a clap of thunder. It was also as indestructible as a diamond. Such is the intellectual vigor which is presented in the art of the Pala period. The Indian philosophy of aesthetics holds that our response to beauty is a realization of the grace which underlies all of creation. A grace which is in all that there is around us. The perception of beauty through the veils of our illusions awakens us to a joyous awareness of the truth. In this period of intellectual vigor, the deities also represent complex parts of realization. One of the most remarkable qualities of the art and philosophy of this time is the great intellectual freedom which it represents. There appears to be no limit to the diversity in which the personal visualizations of the deities are presented.
In the Magadha region stands the Mahabodhi temple, which commemorates the event of the enlightenment of the Buddha. Though greatly restored over the centuries, this 5th or 6th century temple is the oldest grand structure surviving in India. The architecture and sculptures would have inspired the Buddhist art of many Asian countries, from where pilgrims constantly came here. By the 5th century, the search for enlightenment had developed from a solitary personal exercise to an organized intellectual endeavor. Seals excavated at Nalanda show that the great monastic university here was patronized by the late Gupta kings. The earliest remains of monuments and sculptures found here date from the 6th and 7th centuries. Even in its damaged state, the main temple rises over 100 feet. Stucco figures of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas made here set the style which we see in numerous later stone and bronze images. They have sharper features than ever before and convey an impression of the dynamic intellect on which the focus has gone at this time. We see the carrying forward of the artistic traditions of the Sarnath Gupta and post-Gupta periods here. The torsos are smoothly delineated and the body is visible through the diaphanous garments. Half-closed eyes convey the serenity and peace of the earlier deities. Another temple at Nalanda has reliefs on the plinth. These are among the very few stone sculptures surviving in situ of the Pala period. Great stupas were also made further east in present-day Tripura and Bangladesh. Terracotta plaques with reliefs adorn the plinths which remain of the once grand structures at Paharpur and Pilak. These reflect Vajrayana developments in Buddhism and are full of life and vitality. Freestanding images of bodhisattvas and buddhas made out of buff sandstone have been found of the late 8th century. By the 9th century, dark grey and black schist from further east becomes the principal medium. Crowned Buddhas, instead of the earlier bareheaded ascetic figures, begin to appear in Pala times. The crown here denotes the highest spiritual achievement. Wrathful bodhisattvas also begin to appear. These are to awaken the determination and ardent vigor with which the devotee must pursue the search for the truth. The fearlessness with which one must face the obstacles and confusions on this path. In many parts of India, the 8th and 9th centuries saw an increase in the number of bronze images. Metal images of the Pala period are among the finest which were produced. The areas where the largest numbers have been found are Nalanda and Kurkihar near Bodhgaya. Some bronzes are simple compositions with expressions of infinite gentleness and compassion. They also have a lilting grace which reminds us that there is an end to the sorrow of the world. 
Later Pala sculpture is complex and presents the many traditional motifs of Indian art around the main central figure. The deities are increasingly formalized and the iconographic concepts embodied in their various attributes have become more important. The number of bodhisattvas and buddhas, identifiable by their different attributes, have increased. As in the Hindu art of this period, female deities, who are the counterparts of the male ones, have become prolific. These were first seen in the caves of Western India in the 6th century. The path to salvation is now through intense meditation on the qualities of Buddhahood, depicted in deities and complex diagrams. Metal images were much easier to transport than large stone ones. It is these which travel to Nepal, Tibet and further northwards as well as to the countries of Southeast Asia. The sculptures transmitted the concepts and styles of Indic art far and wide in this period. The Sena dynasty came to power in the late 11th century and ruled till the first half of the 13th century. In the later Pala period and during Sena rule, Hindu icons were made in larger numbers. The centers of artistic production also shifted further east in Bihar and to Bengal. Hindu art is stylistically similar to the Buddhist art of this period and presents the same complexity of iconography In this gallery, there are uh, sculptures from Bihar and Bengal from about the 8th century up till the 12th century. And uh, on one side of the room are Buddhist sculptures and the other are Hindu. And there's every reason to think that the same workshops and perhaps even the same artists were, uh, were creating these sculptures either for um, Buddhist use or for Hindu use. And I also think it's perfectly possible that some of the, uh, some of the patrons were uh, commissioning Buddhist uh, images at, for certain occasions and Hindu images for other occasions. Certainly historically there's absolutely no necessity that people of different religions can't live together uh, as good neighbors and collaborators in their work as well. The writings of the Tibetan historian Taranatha and considerable archaeological remains show that Orissa was another great center of Buddhism in Pala times. In the Asiya Hill Range are some of the most important Buddhist sites of the period. Excavations at Ratnagiri have found a large number of sculptures of the 8th to the 12th centuries. In the Buddha figure here and in other sculptures, we see a new feature. The carving is continued on a number of slabs of stone, which are pieced together to form the image. Stylistically, the figures have a massive appearance which reminds us of the Vakataka art of the preceding period in Western India. As in Bihar, the deities of Vajrayana Buddhism are depicted in large numbers. Here at Udaygiri, we see the benign Bodhisattva of Lokiteshwara Kasarpani. He stands in a graceful and relaxed posture, which marks the Buddhist art of Urissa.
Complex iconographic deities are also found, such as this Samvara from Ratnagiri. He holds many attributes in his numerous hands, which provide a detailed visual representation of philosophic concepts. Advanced forms of Tantric Buddhism were developed and travelled from here to the countries of Southeast Asia. Temple doorways continue the traditions established in the Gupta period and seen everywhere later. Such carvings are also seen in the Hindu temples of Bhubaneswar. The interconnectedness of all forms of life is eloquently expressed here. A sense of joy fills these depictions. The art of the Pala period reflects freedom of thought and dynamic philosophic developments. Despite the complex iconography, which is now represented, the best work retains a sense of joy and grace which transport us. These exquisite sculptures take us far away from our material concerns to a realm of peace within us.